Now, I want to more or less visit with you on a very important theme, especially at this time of the year, and that is a message that is prophetic and yet a message that is historical largely. For we are turning tonight actually to lift out three statements out of the ninth, 10th, and 11th chapters of the Epistle to the Romans. You see, when Paul had concluded this great doctrinal section in which he stated that today God has broken down the middle wall of partition, he's declared the whole world under sin, both Jew and Gentile, and that God today is saving man on the basis and one basis alone and that is by faith in Jesus Christ, and that no particular group have any advantage today, that they all stand on the same basis before Almighty God. Then the question would naturally arise in the heart and in the life of every pious Israelite. What about the Old Testament with all of its promises concerning the nation Israel? Will God now forego those? Will he cancel out what he said? Have they been dismissed just with a wave of the hand? Has this so great salvation today that now is worldwide, that's a real ecumenical movement and pays no attention to race or creed, religion, or color or anything, and it says to all men that you're sinners before God and you can only come one way to God? that a ritual makes no difference, that a religion makes no difference today, that anything, even the law, makes no difference even when you have it and say you're keeping it. It won't commend you to God that the only way you come, you come as a sinner. And when you come as a sinner, you take Christ as Savior. Does that mean that all of these promises in the Old Testament that God gave to the nation Israel, does that mean they're just rubbed out? Blanked out. Now, God's through with them. Now, Paul takes three chapters in Romans 9, 10, and 11 to say one word, if you please. No. No. They're not blanked out. They're not rubbed out. They're not erased. God will not let one of those promises go by the board. God will not let one of those promises lapse. Every one of them is to be made good and to be made good in God's own time. So Paul does three things. Paul gives in Romans 9 the history, the past of the nation Israel. In Romans 10, Paul gives the present of the nation Israel. And in Romans 11, Paul gives the future of the nation Israel. Now, very briefly, let us look at the thing that he says now concerning the past of these people. In Romans 9, I'd like to read a few verses. Paul begins this section. Now, you must remember he's concluded this wonderful eighth chapter, and as it were, he's coming down from the mountaintop. And as he comes down, he says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Now here is a man that could say that he was persuaded that nothing could separate him from the love of God which was in Christ Jesus. And now this man can at the same time say, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And you know, that's one of the paradoxes of the Christian faith, that at the same time you can be joyful and at the same time you can be sorrowful. That's one of the things about the Christian life. You can be concerned about the loss and at the same time you can rejoice in the Lord. Now Paul is saying here, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why? Now, my translation reads like this, For I could wish 
that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And I want to say to you tonight that if that is the correct translation, I have to confess I do not understand the Apostle Paul. I do not believe he was a man given to a flowery speech. I do not think that he was a man given to forensic display or any dramatic show. Uh, Here is a man that has just said that he's persuaded nothing can separate him from the love of Christ. Now, do you think Paul is saying that I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren when he knows good and well he can't be? I don't think Paul ever talked like that. I can't find any place else where he used that kind of language, that kind of false, uh, hypocritical way of speaking is not like the Apostle Paul. That might be like some moderns, but it won't be like Paul. I do not understand Paul to say that. I understand him rather to say this, and I believe before God this is the best translation. Will you listen to this? For I was once myself a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul is saying this. Paul says, I one time was just like they are. I was a proud young Pharisee. I hated God. Jesus Christ. I had no use for him at all. I did not care for him. Those of you that looked in on the TV program, you heard the testimony of Brother Danny Rose, and he told about the first time as a Jew that he went into a church. He put his finger over the name Christ because he said, at that time I hated him. But Brother Danny hastened to say, I love him today just like I hated him back in those days. You see, that was his feeling as a Jew. May I say that was the feeling of the Apostle Paul. He hated Christ. And it was in that situation that this man came to know Christ, and when he came to know Christ, he could look back and he could say, I know exactly how my brethren feel. And that's one of the reasons that the Lord Jesus picked this man was because this man could endure what probably you and I could not endure when they brought charges against him. When they followed him, you remember after he was arrested, they kept pursuing him until he finally had to appeal. As a Roman citizen, he had to appeal to Caesar. They kept right on in every court. They went after this little fellow. And yet Paul, as far as I can tell, never grew impatient. I think I would have finally said, well, why in the world don't they let me alone? Paul never said that because Paul says, I know exactly how they feel. I felt the same way. I know why they're after me. I know why they hate me. I know why they're trying to kill me because I felt that way once. He says, I was once a curse from Christ. I was once one who hated him. And I know how they feel about him. Now, will you listen? He now answers a question that, believe me, needs to be answered today. Who are Israelites? Who are we talking about when we talk about Israelites? Well, he gives here eight points of identification. And I must of necessity be very brief here, but I want you to notice these points of identification, for they are very important. The first one is this. To whom pertaineth the adoption? Now, you will find, and I don't want to be tedious tonight, but I think I probably should do this. Those of you who followed us in Isaiah know that we took the 64th chapter, and where it says in verse 8, But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, We are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. You will see from that that the way the nation Israel thought of God, that he was not the father of each individual. He was the father of the nation, and was the father of the nation by creation. 
never by redemption, never by the new birth. They never felt, no individual Israelite felt like going to God and saying, My Father. You see, when the Lord Jesus gave them that prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, that was brand new to them. They had never spoken to God like that. They had never called him their father. You, they only thought of him in the sense that he was their creator, and he had created them as a nation down in the land of Egypt. He brought them out, and he was a father to the nation, if you please, the nation that he had redeemed. And now, Paul says, it's to them that belongs the adoption. You, God says, out of all the nations of the earth, you only have I known, says God. There's not another people on top side of this earth that is a nation that can ever say that God chose them as a nation. God never chose, I'm sorry to say, but he never chose America. I'm afraid there's some folk think that today. They call us a Christian nation and all that. But honestly, God has not chosen us as a nation, and yet I think God has blessed this nation in a remarkable way, and I'm confident God raised it up. But nowhere can it be said that we are a chosen people, or that any nation has the adoption. Only the nation Israel. God says, you only have I chosen out of all the peoples of the earth. You only have I known. This is the one nation that God chose. The, the adoption belongs to them. Then the second thing, if you please, and the glory. The glory belongs to them. The glory was the visible manifestation of God in their midst. You remember that when Moses finished the tabernacle, that he backed off and all the Levites, and the glory of the Lord filled it. The Shekinah presence of God was there. And that made this nation unique. They had the visible presence of God. I think one of the most interesting things that I've been following this time going through the Bible is to follow that glory, the visible presence of God in their midst. Followed them through the wilderness. Every time they sinned, the glory was manifested and burned through the camp. You find that when they went into the land, God says, I'm with you, I'm still with you. And that when the temple was built, the glory filled the temple. And somewhere along their checkered career, the glory withdrew. I believe that that's what the Lord Jesus meant when he said in the Olivet Discourse that at that time, he says, the day that's coming, ye shall see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. I believe that the sign of the Son of Man in heaven is that visible glory, which when he came 1,900 years ago was not manifest. There were times when it broke through, but very seldom was it seen. That glory was not revealed. Well, when they went in, it was just a little old baby. That's all, just a little baby. Glory was not that. Uh, may I say it's artists that have put the light in there. God didn't. He laid aside something, not his deity. He laid aside his glory. Now the Lord Jesus said, There's a day coming when ye shall see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. I believe that sign is that visible glory which these people had back yonder and after the church is removed out of this earth and God turns again to this nation. That will be their sign. That's the sign that God is with them and is coming with them. It's the sign of the visible glory, if you please. Then we have here the third thing, and the covenant. God has made certain covenants with the nation Israel that he's not made with you and me. I'll tell you one of them is the Sabbath day. God nowhere gave you the Sabbath day. He said to the nation Israel, you only have I given the Sabbath day, and it's a covenant between you and me, nobody else. It's not for the rest of the world. Somebody said to me, when was the Sabbath day changed? Brother, it's never been changed, still there. We have another day. The church is pleased. Instead of taking the last day of the week, we take the first day of the week. 
The day he came back from the dead, and we recognize the first day of the week. We have nothing to do with the old sabbatic day or the sabbatic year or the year of jubilee. That is a covenant God made with the nation Israel. Paul says the covenants belong to them. These are peculiar covenants that God made with these people. Now he has a covenant with you and me. You know what that covenant is? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's covenant with you. God says to any man, if you will believe me, just like Abraham believed me, if you will just believe me, I'll save you. That's what God said. That's his covenant to you and me. But the covenant he made to Israel, he said, I'm going to give you a land. He never said that to me. I don't think he said it to you. He never promised you a land. In fact, he hasn't promised the church anything down here material. If God's blessed you materially, you sure ought to thank him. That's extra. That's something that he never guaranteed to any of his own down here. But he did say that we have spiritual blessings. To the nation Israel, he gave material blessings. And those, by the way, are blessings even for the future. The covenants belong to them. And fourth, and the giving of the law. And may I say to you that the law was given to the nation Israel, that they might be a laboratory demonstration so that the whole world would become guilty before God. They could see that given to a people under ideal conditions in the land that the law was adapted to, that these people over a period of approximately 1,200 years were not able to keep the law. Therefore, God has demonstrated that that is something that could never lift man up. It did not lift these people up. In fact, they are scattered tonight throughout the world because of the broken law. But the law was given to them. God says there's a day coming when I'm going to write that law in their heart. Just as I wrote it on tables of stone, I'll write it in their heart. That's one of the things he'll do for them in the millennium. And then the fifth thing, and the service of God. Now, God never has given to the church a service like the priesthood. In other words, there's no such thing as priests in the church. Every believer is a priest, and you have access to God. But tonight, we do not have a service in that sense. Some folk are disturbed. Because on the TV program, we don't have prayer there. We're not taking that time for prayer. We're trying to talk to unsaved folk. We try to pray before and after with the hope you'll remember it in prayer. But we're not doing that. And the thing is that we just don't believe today that you can give us any scripture for following any kind of a procedure in a service. It hasn't been given a service to us. We have an order of service in the bulletin. And I give you my word, I don't know why we follow it, as we do. I guess it's to, in order to begin and end at the same time. But honestly, it doesn't come from the Word of God because the service wasn't given to us. Now, the children of Israel were given a service. It had a tabernacle. They had to do certain things a certain way in that tabernacle. You and I are not given anything like that today at all. May I say the service of God belongs to them. And six, and the promises. And will you hear me? There are so many today, in fact, I want to say this tonight kindly, but here is where practically every denomination today has come in and nullified the Word of God. They say that all the promises in the Old Testament are no longer for Israel but for the church. May I say to you, Paul makes it very clear after he's given eight wonderful chapters in Romans, that the promises still belong to the nation Israel. I think it's interesting. I was visiting Dr. Harry Ironside when he was pastor to Moody Church, and he had a tremendous library. And as I started to leave, we stopped by a shelf of books, and he says, look here, I've got something I'd like to show you. It's an old English Bible that was sent to me the other day, and I'd like you to see this. And he turned back in the Old Testament, and I think that we were somewhere along in Isaiah, Jeremiah. And as we went along, it said, Blessings for the Church. 
blessings for the church. Wonderful, isn't it? Taking all the blessings God had given to Israel, blessings for the church. Then we turn to another page, and it says, Curses for Israel. You see, they were willing to take all the blessings, but they're going to leave the curses for Israel. May I say to you tonight, let's leave it all for them. Curses are there, that's true, but the blessings are there. The promises are theirs. God has given to them, as he's given to us, exceeding great promises. And those promises can never be nullified. God will make every one of them that he's promised to the nation Israel, he'll make those good. And then the seventh thing is, whose are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob belong to them, not to us. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob belong to the nation Israel. You find that there are great many people who want to get in on, on it. And they call themselves that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our father. Well, they just don't happen to be our father at all. Now, we've seen in our high noon broadcast that Abraham is the father of us all, but by faith. And that's the only way he could be the father of us all. By faith, apart from any ritual circumcision, apart from the law, 400 years before the law was given. Now, will you notice the eighth and the last? Of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Now, Paul says that the Lord Jesus Christ was a Jew. Now, a great many people today, and right here in Southern California, I'll get letters from what I'm saying right now. It's all right. I'm used to them after ten years. I don't mind them. But I want to say this to you tonight, that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this earth and he took upon himself a flesh in the line of David. And when he walked this earth, he was known as a Jew. Let me say this to you. I want to call just one witness tonight. And she saw him, she knew him. And if he had not been a Jew, she would have been the first one to have detected it. It was the woman of Samaria at the well. She said this to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Do you want to bring somebody to the witness stand tonight to contradict that? Oh, you say, well, I can get you somebody here in Los Angeles. Yeah, you can get somebody in Los Angeles to contradict anything. But you get somebody, my brother, my sister tonight, who saw him and who knew him, who will say otherwise. Paul says, as concerning the flesh, he came into my nation. I happen to be an Israelite. He came into my nation. He was one of us. But now, Paul says to the Corinthians, we know him no longer after the flesh. We do not know him tonight, friends, as the man who walked here 1,900 years ago, born of a little baby in Bethlehem. Right tonight, at this very moment while we are here, he's seated at God's right hand, glorified, in a glorified body. And we know him no longer after the flesh. Now, these are the people. This is their history. This is their past. The Old Testament is about them. Now, they had all of this. And somebody says, well, believe me, when you've got all of that, you don't need anything. Listen to Paul. Paul, for the Jew at the present, listen to him. Chapter 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You can have a religion, you can have a God-given religion, it had gone to seed, of course, then, but you can have all of this, in fact, you can say you believe the Old Testament, and you can still be lost. They had everything, and yet Paul says they're not saved. 
my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is, they might be saved. They might be saved. They might come to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. Now, very briefly, and may I conclude by saying this concerning their present state, God today has put us all in one class. And there's no distinction today in mankind as we stand before Almighty God. You talk about an ecumenical movement. God's got the greatest ecumenical movement going, and he has a regular United Nations. And you know what the United Nations is? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that includes everybody and includes you, religious folk, church members. And I'm more and more coming to the conclusion that a man who has not come to God as a sinner has not been saved. I don't care what he thinks of Christ. If you have not seen yourself as a sinner, then you have never seen him as a Savior. He came into the world to save sinners. And that's all. Save sinners. And until you and I see ourselves as sinners, we can never be saved. we got too many people in the church today that are just nice folk. One man up in Altadena, he's dead now, member of every lodge. I used to talk with him. Well, he says, Dr. McGee, what do you talk to me about being a sinner? I never even got a traffic ticket. And I'd picked up at least three that year. And I said, Brother, I've got three of them. But long before I got a traffic ticket, I knew I needed a Savior, and you needed a Savior. Why, he's a church member, a member of a half a dozen lodges, prominent. He needed just one thing, to see himself as a sinner. And tonight, friends, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, whether you are black or white, whether you are rich or poor, whether you're a church member or not a church member, you stand before God a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All stand on one basis. God doesn't look down here at this world. He doesn't see you a little better than somebody else. He sees you a lost sinner for whom Christ died. You know, you can get up yonder high enough that when you look down here, a man standing on Mount Whitney and a man on an ant hill in Texas look the same height, and God's seeing you from pretty high up. And you may tonight think you're standing on Mount Whitney, but before Almighty God, you're just on an ant hill in Texas in his sight. You're a sinner in his sight, and you need his marvelous, wonderful grace. And these people, Paul said, they're religious. Oh, I was religious. I was a Pharisee. I had everything. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that it might be saved. What about the future of these people? One of these days, God will conclude his purpose in the church. And when he does, the church will be taken out of this world. God has no permanent purpose in the church in the world. His purpose in the church is that he might call out a people to his name. When that's concluded, he'll take the church out to meet him. And the church, again, will never have an earthly mission, as far as I can tell. I don't know about you, but I like this business of sending rockets to the moon. I like all that because I think out yonder somewhere there's a universe that is at least a planet. God's going to let me run someday. I sure hope you're going to come visit me. And, you know, when God put man in the Garden of Eden, he had control of this earth. Have you ever noticed Adam had dominion? He ran the place. And that means he controlled the weather. When he wanted sunshine, he had sunshine. When he wanted rain, he had rain. And when he wanted smog, he didn't have it. He didn't want it. He just never got it. He controlled the elements, Adam did. And 
I think we'll all be given a planet up yonder. I was talking to one of these astronomers, and I asked him, I said, do you think around these suns, the planets? He said, you know, we don't know it, but I'm almost sure they're there, and I am too. And I think he's got one of them labeled for you, one of them I hope labeled for me. I hope you come up and visit me. I'll give you any kind of weather you want the day you come to see me. Be wonderful, my friend. God's purpose in the church is not in this world. But God has an earthly purpose, and that's with the nation Israel. And the minute the church is taken out of this earth, God will turn to these people to consummate his purpose and to fulfill all of his promises. And I conclude with this. And my brother, I'm not going into details of God's future program for these people, but this ought to be enough to answer the question of those who think God's through with these people. Listen, chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Listen to him. If you didn't get him in the first verse, Paul don't want you to miss it. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. God's not through with it. And one of these days when his purposes in the church are concluded... He'll turn to these people again, and Paul goes on to say, verse 26, So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. He's coming to this earth to establish his kingdom, fulfill all of his purposes, all of his promises to these people. And may I say, as we stand on the end of this year and the threshold of a new year, again, I do not think I'm being fanatic, but I never come to the end of the year without saying, Oh, Lord, I hope we don't have to go through another new year. I hope that you can end the earthly career of the church this year. I don't know about you, but I'd like for this to be the last one as far as the church is concerned. I'd like it to be the last one. But I want to say to you, I don't know. I have no inside information. I only know this, that my hope tonight and your hope tonight is one of these days he's coming to take his church out of this world. And when he does, then God's time peace. Not G-R-U-E-N, not B-U-L-O-V-A, but I S. R-A-E-L, will be ticking again, and God will turn to these people. And when he does, then you will find him dealing with an earthly people on this earth. May I say tonight, what is your hope for the future, Jen, or the new year? What is your hope? Do you have a heavenly hope tonight? Are you going to try to get rich this year? Going to try to make a name for yourself? Going to try to pay off the mortgage? What's your ambition for this coming year? Do you have a heavenly hope someday of being with the Lord? That's the hope tonight he offers to human beings, all human beings down here. Shall we pray? As we pray tonight, very briefly, and I won't take but a moment for this, but I'm wondering if you are here tonight, and that's not your hope. But tonight you'd like to, at this last service of the old year, like to say this evening, Preacher, the best I know how tonight, I'd like for that to be my hope, a heavenly hope of trusting Christ as Savior. I'd like to accept his promise of eternal life by trusting Christ. I'll accept that tonight, the best I know how.